So we turned to DNA to try to help solve the mysteries surrounding the Spiran surname and the various branches that we have identified. And there really isn't that much to doing a DNA test. You either do a swab or give a sample of saliva. That goes into a little test tube and that goes off to the lab. And in the lab, they look at your sample, they put it through the machine, the analyzer, and your results are printed for you on your own personal web page with your username and password to ensure privacy. Not only that, but they also um, compare your results with everybody else's in the database and provide you with a list of matches, genetic matches, uh, who would be your genetic cousins uh, with whom you share a common ancestor sometime in the, in the past, whether that's a couple of hundred years or a couple of thousand years. Uh, not only that, but they allow you to also start projects, and the Spear and Surname Project is one of these. And Family Tree DNA have done a great job at creating an infrastructure for these type of surname projects. So let's take a closer look at that little sample of DNA in your test tube. Uh, when you swabbed your cheeks, you dislodged some cheek cells, and this is what an average cheek cell looks like. You have the nucleus up here, which is the big green blob, and then these blue things are called mitochondria. And these mitochondria contain their own DNA, it's circular in nature, and this mitochondrial DNA is only passed on from mother to child. So I would have got it from my mother, she got it from her mother, she got it from her mother, and so on and so on. Within the nucleus of the cell, we have the chromosomes, and we have 46 chromosomes arranged into 23 chromosome pairs. One copy of each chromosome you get from your father, the other copy you get from your mother. And that is true for all of the 46 chromosomes. So you have one paternal copy and one maternal copy. You get half of your chromosomes from your father, half from your mother. The last pair of chromosomes, chromosome pair 23, are also known as the sex chromosomes. And these can either be, uh, a sex chromosome can be an X chromosome or a Y chromosome. So if you have two X chromosomes, then you're a woman. If you have an X and a Y chromosome, then you turn into a man. So uh, the Y chromosome is particularly interesting because it is only passed on from, mother, from father to son. And so that is a very good way of tracing your father's 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 line all the way back in time. So those are the main types of DNA. We have mitochondrial DNA, which follows the direct female line, mother, mother, mother. We have the Y chromosome, which follows the direct male line, father, father, father. We have the autosomal DNA, which is all of the chromosomes apart from this pair 23. And then we have the X chromosome. Women have two Xs, men just have the one. And so there are three main types of DNA test. The first type is the Y DNA test, and that goes back along the father's, father's, father's line uh, to about 338,000 years ago. So it's very, very useful for tracing a deep ancestry and is used extensively for studying the migration of human beings uh, when they made their last successful major exodus out of Africa about 50,000 years ago or so. And there were other exoduses out of Africa before then, but they all ended in failure and the humans died out. And that is why you do find human remains in, say, for example, Israel going back to maybe 120, 130,000 years ago. But these humans would have died out. And it's only the last exodus, about 50,000 years ago, the last successful major exodus that has resulted in the population of the rest of the world with present-day non-Africans. On the other side of the family tree, the mother's 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 line is traced with mitochondrial DNA, and this has a reach of about 200,000 years, and that takes us well uh, way back into Africa before the last exodus. And then between these two branches, 
we have <clears throat> the autosomal DNA covering all of the ancestral lines, but this has a very limited reach, only about two, five or six or seven generations, which would take you roughly back to your great, 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 great grandparents, and you have 64 of those. So whilst uh, Y-DNA and mitochondrial DNA are very, very useful for deep and recent ancestry, they only tell you about the extremities of your family tree. The direct male line on one side, the direct female line on the other side. The autosomal DNA covers all of your ancestral lines, and that, uh, but it only has a, a relatively short reach of about 200 or 250 years from your date of birth. And this is your typical Y chromosome. There's a, a short arm at the top of the chromosome, and then there's the centromere area, and then there's the long arm below. And all along the length of the chromosome, there are these various genes uh, which can code for specific um, characteristics, the characteristics that make us human. And this rather facetious uh, example shows that on uh, the male Y chromosome we have uh, genes that code for the inability to see or hear the obvious. We have uh, uh, a gene that codes for self-confidence or the ability to remember and tell jokes or the refusal to ask for directions. All typical male characteristics. Uh, this of course is done uh, tongue-in-cheek but there is a degree of truth in it all. So in the early days of uh, the study, we had four people volunteering to do the DNA test, and they did the Y DNA test, testing first at my heritage, which was a different company, which was later bought by Family Tree DNA, and the uh, results of the uh, DNA tests were transferred to Family Tree DNA. There was a variety of different spellings of the surname. There was Spearing with a G, there was Spearin with an E and an A, and a Spearin with two E's, and they came from all over the world, Ontario, New Jersey, Limerick, and Australia. And the big question was, could these widely separated families be related to each other? Now, when you first get your Y DNA results, it's a string of numbers. And the way I like to think of it is, imagine the Y chromosome lying on its side, and all along the length of the Y chromosome are these markers. Now, the markers are different from the genes. The genes only take up around about 2% of the human genome. So only 2% of your chromosome is actually contains genes. The rest of it contains uh, areas of DNA that actually regulate the genes, switches that turn them on and turn them off. So uh, the markers that we find in uh, the Y chromosome reported here uh, may or may not lie within a genetic area. They might actually lie within a non-genetic area of the actual Y chromosome, uh, the part that's called the exome, uh, sometimes called junk DNA because it was previously thought that this DNA didn't actually have any function. But in actual fact, now we're revising that idea and we think that a lot of what we previously called junk DNA actually does have a regulatory function. But even then, that only accounts for 30% of the DNA that, we, that, that is on the chromosome. We don't know what the other 70% of the DNA actually does. At this point in time, things will become clear, no doubt, in the future. But just imagine when you see the results that you have the Y chromosome lying on its side, the markers indicated here along its length, and below each marker is the value associated with that particular marker in this individual. And different individuals will have different values for these different markers. Uh, people who have the same values are probably more closely related to each other than people who have very, very different values. Uh, so taken on its own, these values don't really tell you very much. They might tell you what haplogroup you belong to, and that really is a collection of people who have a similar genetic signature. So for example, people in Western Europe will tend to have uh, genetic signatures that are very different from people in China. Just because as man emerged from Africa, uh, small mutations occurred in the DNA, and these mutations accrued over time and created a particular genetic profile in one particular part of the world, whereas people in another part of the world 
had developed their own unique and separate genetic signature. So in and of themselves, the Y-DNA results are not extremely useful. The real value of the DNA comes when you're able to compare it with other people. And this is what the results page of the Spear and Surname project looks like. This is the Y-DNA colorized chart. And uh, it really is, if you like, uh, imagine that the Y-DNA of these various people are stacked upon each other. And these were the first four people in the project. You can see the different surname spellings there. Here's the most distant known ancestor, all of them going back to Limerick, all of them brick-walled around about 1800, 1830, all originating from Ireland. And there's the haplogroup, I2B1, all belonging to the same haplogroup. And then along here we have the names of the markers. If you like, you can imagine it as the Y chromosome uh, on its side. And uh, below that, you can imagine the Y chromosome of each of these people just stacked upon each other. So let's take a look, a closer look at the first 37 of these Y-DNA markers. And here's the first person. This is Bob, uh, testing first with my uh, heritage. And the one below is exactly the same, but this tested at Family Tree DNA. Um, and there's some additional markers there that weren't included in the My Heritage results. And then when we compared Bob's results with the other three of the first four people, you can see that the value for uh, this first marker, which is known as DYS393, DIS393, they were all 15, 15, 15, 15, 15. The second one, they were all 23. The third one, all 15, and so on and so on, all exactly the same until you get to CDYB, whereas it was 41 for two of the participants, 40 for uh, the first one for Bob, and 42 for, uh, for Neil in Australia. Um, so these were uh, either exact or close matches, and that was the very first important lesson that DNA told us. It said to us, you are all closely genetically related to each other. The second lesson was, beware of surname spellings, it is misleading. The third lesson was, you're on the right track, keep going. And lastly, uh, more and more people tested. A lot of people uh, tested, and they were all tracing themselves back to Limerick, all with different spellings and all exact matches. So lesson four was any spearing who can trace their ancestry back to Limerick is probably a close genetic match to everyone in genetic family one. Uh, for the DNA testing of my spearing line, well, I'm a Gleason, so my direct male line goes Gleason, 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 Gleason. My Spearin ancestor is here, right in the middle of my tree. So what I had to do, I had to actually trace back to my great-great-great-grandfather and then trace all of his descendants in the hope of finding a direct male line descendant. And I found one and uh, I approached him and he agreed to do the DNA test acting as a proxy for my spear and line, and he was an exact match to everyone else in what we call genetic family one. So this was uh, a great way of uh, showing that uh, everybody who uh, was related to genetic family one uh, was related to each other. Um, these were people who generally had a roadblock at around about 1800, uh, but who could all trace their most distant known ancestor back to Limerick. So, so far what we can conclude is that the Hartwell forename links the Ontario One family to the early Limerick Spearins. And those are the Hartwells in the early Limerick, Limerick Spearin tree and in the Ontario One tree. And before we did even any genetic testing, the people in Ontario One could reliably uh, deduce with 99% probability that they were descended from these early Limerick Spearins. However, the DNA confirmed that all families are related. So all of these yellow people are the people who have tested. All of the red 
uh, people are the most distant known ancestors, and you can see most of them occurring around about 1800, some of them occurring around about 1830. So the DNA tested, testing said that we all shared a common ancestor. But because Ontario 1 had a very reliable association with the early Limerick Spirans, we could now say that because everyone is genetically related, all the families can piggyback onto the longest genealogy in the group, and that is the one with Ontario 1. So everybody can piggyback and jump back in time across the divide of the silent century of the 1700s, back to the early Limerick Spirans, back to Matthew and Luke, and the wills of 1719 and 1726. However, there are still some further questions that need to be addressed. Despite the fact that we're able to jump back in time, most people still have about three or four missing generations before they can make a definite link to one of the early Limerick Spirans. And we still don't know whether people are related to Matthew, to Nicholas, or to Luke. So that's a question that remains to be addressed. Second question is, can we link to these London Spearings, the ones that were goldsmiths in London? Um, can we link also to the Cambridge Spearings, the ones that were granted the license to print and became the first printers of the Cambridge University Press? And then what about the link to Flanders? Can we go back that far? These are the questions that needed to be addressed. And in order to address them, we set up uh, a much more robust research structure. Uh, we set up a website and a blog to document and publish our research. We set up a Facebook page, uh, which has a social aspect, but it also encouraged people to share information and encouraged further recruits to the actual DNA project. We also set up the DNA project as a formal project with Family Tree DNA, and currently we have about 70 members. And we also established the project as a one-name study with the Guild of One-Name Studies. We did a lot of more in-depth work. We gathered a lot more information on the early Limerick Spirans. We traced two lines to modern descendants uh, using documentary evidence. We also uncovered lots of information regarding the London Spearings, but the link to Limerick still needs elaboration. We also developed uh, or discovered lots of information on the Cambridge Spearings, but the link to London needs elaboration. We discovered very little information on European Spearings, largely because we don't speak Dutch and access to the Dutch records is problematic. But we did identify 236 Spearin or Spearing families worldwide, and we have started reconstructing trees from available data. And these are summarized on the traditional family table on the website. So the next part of this presentation will talk about the early Limerick Spearins, the London Spearings, and the Cambridge Spearings. <laughs>